But I want Wednesday night to be something that we look forward to. This isn't just a filling the, fill the time spot. It's, it is another chance to get to spend with Jesus and with one another. And, and I don't look at it as a watered down version of Sunday. It's unique in its own way. And uh, I want us to look forward to being together. And I think most of us that come, I think we do. But it's an exciting time uh, for us as a church. This is, it's an exciting time in the nation as, as we get ready to bring on another president. Um, and we'll just see. All we do is pray for him and pray that God uses him to do uh, miraculous things and that God really speaks to his heart. And uh, But it is our job to pray for him. And it is our job to, uh, to lift him up every day and to uh, pray that he would have wisdom. Amen? Amen? Last week we talked about Acts chapter 2. And Acts chapter 2 is, uh, of course, famous for um, the Holy Spirit coming. And uh, if you want to follow along tonight, too, in the uh, Bible events in you version, it is there as well. And you can go to it, and there's some more notes there. Um, but we had a lot, I told you we had a lot of material last week. So before we get into chapter 3, uh, I want to ask you some questions about chapter 2. And uh, number one, what day had the uh, Holy Spirit arrived on? On Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. 50 days after Passover. Uh, so it arrived on Pentecost. Uh, so also, what, what did those filled with the Spirit begin to do? They began to speak in tongues. And it talked about how they were able to communicate with people from all different nations um, that were there at the time. Um, it says that in Jerusalem, this is just some, some for your information, though, were devout Jews from every nation. And it says, what indicates that the tongues were known languages of men? If you remember what indicated to us that, hey, this is an actual tongue, this is an actual language. Do you remember? That's right. It said everyone heard them speak in his own language. And the people said, we hear them speaking in our own tongues. So, uh, so, so pretty good there. Um, just looking through some of these questions here. There's a bunch of them here. Upon whom would the Spirit be poured out? Now this is when Peter gets up and he starts um, preaching. And takes advantage of the situation. He said that the Spirit would be poured out on who? All flesh. All people. All flesh. God's men servants and maid servants. And that's in verse 17 and 18. Um, let's see. One, one or two more before we go on. Uh, what is the main proposition of Peter's sermon? In other words, what was his main point? And I'll even give you a a hint that he, he said something about Jesus there, and this was his main point, trying to um, trying to show the validity of who Jesus was. They killed him, God raised him. That's exactly, it's funny that you said, God raised Jesus from the dead is exactly right. That was the main thing. He said, you killed him, you need to repent for what you've done, because they said, hey, what, what should we do? What should we do? And he said, repent first. And, then, and um, then be baptized. And then be what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. That was the next thing he said. Um, and he said it was available to everyone. All right. So now let's go on. Anything about uh, chapter 2 you want to discuss before we move on into chapter 3 tonight? Anything? Uh, if, if you have the Bible app and you're following along in that, there's a lot more notes than what we ever cover in here. And... Um, it's just, I, I go out and I, and I try to find somebody who's taught it before, and I read their notes, and if it's really good, I'll use those, and I'll put them in there, and just so you'll have extra something that I can lean back on to, because these guys will spend way, way more time than any of us have in a week to kind of put these things together, and they study them in depth, so we get as much knowledge as we can, history, and uh, different things from those notes, and I have some of them here, and I'll share some of them. 
But at the same time, we probably, as usual, won't have time to go on. All right, so Acts chapter 3. Uh-oh. Yeah, just fire that up again. They probably have to stop it and start it again to get it to work. But anyway, uh, Acts chapter 3, and if you can just look at that next one. I'll bring it back up in a second, man. That's fine, that's fine. All right, uh, do you have chapter 3? I did. Read verse 1. It says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. All right, that's good. Where did you get to? Uh, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> okay. Alright, so verse 1, the ninth hour. Now, I didn't know much about this before that, but the ninth hour, the Jews divided the time from sunrise to sunset into 12 hours, which were consequently of unequal length at different times of the year. As the days were longer or shorter, uh, the third hour, therefore, was nine in the morning. The ninth, the ninth was three in the afternoon, but not exactly. It's kind of a guess, but they divide it into 12 equal spots. Now, um, let's see, I'm trying to find out. Which, which meant if the sun rose at 5, the earliest hour of its rising in that climate was half an hour after 8. If at 7, the latest hour of its rising there was half an hour after 9. And the chief hours of prayer were the 3rd and the ninth, at which seasons the morning and evening sacrifices were offered and incense, a kind of emblem representing prayer, burnt on the gold altar. So you can kind of get an idea of how that came out. The times of daylight was split, in, was split into 12 kind of equal sections. And they tried to pray at the third hour and at the ninth hour. That was the two times where they prayed the most. And during those times they offered sacrifices. So kind of give you a little more insight into verse 1. And it says, Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple they called beautiful which he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. Now this gate that's called Beautiful was actually built by Herod the Great uh, between the court of the Gentiles and that of Israel, and it was 30 cubits high and 15 feet broad. So you kind of understand how big this thing was. And it was made of brass, Corinthian brass to be exact, and more pompous in its workmanship and splendor than those that were covered with silver and gold. So it was kind of gaudy. We'll just say that. The Herod the Great, uh, he had a little bit of an ego, and he built this gate, and he drew attention to it, and that's why it was called beautiful, because it was really, it was ornate in nature. And so when Peter saw, uh, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Now, now we know that they did not have any of that. But that's what he asked him for. And he said, Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. And he said, so the man gave them his attention, expecting, expecting to get something from him. And then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Some say rise up and walk. Rise up and walk. It's interesting that Peter draws his attention and says, Look at us. Look at me. And when the guy turns and looks, he says, listen, I don't have any gold or silver, but what I do have, I give you. And what we talked about Sunday was that you can't give somebody something that you don't have. See, a lot of people are passing the crippled man day after day after day. They said that he came to this gate every day asking for money. And I'm sure people met his need of the moment, but they didn't meet his need of a lifetime. And for us, yeah. I was just going to say, I've never, never thought about this or noticed this, but somebody that has begged his whole life is probably not likely to have good eye contact with people. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a self-image kind of issue. Yeah. And so he says, you look at us, you know, because he probably was begging but not looking at <coughs> my eye because he was ashamed he had to beg. Yeah, and he spends, it's interesting that he spends every day there, and it's, you know, this is at a temple, or it's at the gate of the temple. These are religious people that are passing him every day, and no one has thought to 
right, you know, to get him to walk. No one has thought that healing might be offered to this crippled man. They did buy food. They would have more mercy and money here than anywhere else. Yeah, I'm sure it was a great place to be because he knew people were coming every day in and out to pray. They offer sacrifices. He knew that there were people that would have compassion on him, hopefully. But see, what's interesting, though, is you have all these religious people, but none of them have this mindset of, hey, there's a deeper need here than just money. And, and we can't, you know, sometimes we may pray for people and they're not healed and they don't get up and walk. But what we do have the ability to, to do is offer, you know, salvation through Jesus. And people are asking for other things, but they need salvation and we're not offering that either. See what I'm saying? There's, there's like a correlation here between we, we, we need to give out of what we have. And out of our relationship with Jesus, we're able to give to, uh, to those around us. Alright, so he said, Silver God, I do not have, but what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. And now just get up and walk. And then, verse 7, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. And he jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. And then that, that next part is just that Peter begins to speak to the onlookers. But they were filled with wonder and amazement at what was happening. See, when you're working within the power of the Holy Spirit, it will bring a sense of wonder and amazement. And what God is able to do. And that's what we've been talking about. Is that power that comes from working in the Holy Spirit. They, they offer him something that humanly is just impossible to do. You know? But what was more valuable to him? Because now that he can get up on his feet, he can work. So realistically, they met both his needs. Because God has a way of doing things halfway. So they met his physical need. They met his spiritual need because I would guarantee you he's a believer at this point. And it says that not only that, but it wasn't just for him, but it was for everyone who knew him. And my thing was a uh, huge jumping thing. Yeah, yeah, mine did. <laughs> hey, let me tell you, I'll jump with you when we start seeing that happen. I, 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 I'll get in line. Um, because, you know, it, it's amazing. It's not that healing is, yes, it's for him. Physically, he needs the healing. But the, the healing is not just for him. It's for everybody who's known him. Because it says that they immediately, they recognized him as the guy who had been out there. And they were standing there amazed and in awe. Because you know what? He probably wasn't just crippled. He was probably maimed. You know, back then, they didn't have the things that we have now. And so if you were crippled and you had been sitting on your legs for a long time and arthritis had set in and your leg was all crooked, you know, as an old tree branch or something and it's all stuck up under you and the muscles in it are all small because you can't walk on them so they shrink. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody who their legs are small because they can't ever stand up on them. Now all of a sudden they look and his legs are strong. He's running around. Yeah, and all everything has straightened out. You know, you almost wonder if there was some snapping and some popping as he stood to his feet, putting things back in line and, and getting things back together. Who knows? All right, so verse 11. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colony. And when people saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us? As if by uh, our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk. So why are you shocked? Why are you coming and looking at us acting like we're something special? And then he says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. And you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. And you killed the author of life. But God has raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this. Now if you're talking to Jews, they're good with the first part. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our fathers. They're good with the first part. But that line has glorified his servant Jesus. 
That's going to rub them the wrong way. <laughs> because they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And so, so he says, listen, the God that you know of, the Hebrew God who's, who's always been with us, who's been our father, he glorified Jesus. But yet you handed him over to be killed. So he puts the blame on their back. He really rubs it in, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how, would, how would that work today if we, it, it would be great if, if we got to get to heal and went to the hospital of somebody who's been just a terrible person and, and you heal him and his family and tell him terrible and say, hey, this is the guy y'all been talking about. This is one y'all would follow with us. Uh, it's the same thing today, really. Yeah, yeah. I think people have a hard time believing it. But at the same time, they can't explain it through anything else. And so they're forced to have to go, okay, well, maybe this is. And, and I like how Peter puts the blame on their back a little bit. He killed the author of life. He uses some, some big terminology here. But God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. Now, uh, verse 16, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that this Messiah would suffer. In other words, you're seeing the very things that you've memorized played out in front of you. Because what we talked about before was that these Jewish boys were... We're, we're memorizing the, the Bible of, of the time, whether it was the, uh, the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, or, or, or full on out, the Old Testament there, what was written and what was available to them. And they knew these prophecies. And the reason we know they knew these prophecies is because Peter quotes them word for word to them. And it's recorded word for word. I mean, literally, like if you look at Joel and then you look in Acts, it's word for word what he's saying. And he had to memorize down to the detail. And so he's talking to other people who know as much as he does. Because you think about it, Peter was awful. He was a fisherman, so it wasn't like he was this great intellect. But yet he knew all of these scriptures. Because it had been ingrained <coughs> since he was a child. And so, so he says, hey, this is who was foretold that was going to come and who was going to suffer for you. Look at what was told and look at what has happened. And don't those things align? And that's what he's trying to prove. He's trying to, to, to walk them through this. And it says that this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that this Messiah would suffer. He says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. And it says, heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through, the whole, through his holy prophets. So we're still in that time of waiting in verse 21. And it says, for Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. And you must listen to everything he tells you. And anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have, who have spoken have foretold of these days, and you are heirs of and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. And He said to Abraham, "Through your offspring, all people on earth will be blessed." And when God raised up His servant, He sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So. This is what we see. We see that Peter performs a miracle and then he points it back as a tool to try to convert everyone there to Jesus. Alright? So let's, let's go back and let's look at this in, in, in depth a little bit here. Let's stop right around 4, verse 6. Alright, verse 6 it says, Then said Peter, Silver and gold have I none. All right, so the difference in Peter and everybody else who's come in contact with this man is that, can you imagine a bishop of Rome would not be able to say those things? They were well off. All of the religious leaders of that time, even Paul, when he, you know, Paul is a religious leader, as, as Saul, but he's a religious leader. He's very well off. 
And Peter is probably the first one that could look at that, uh, at that uh, crippled man and say, hey, I don't have any silver or gold. Just distinguishing the difference of how Jesus has presented himself as, as opposed to the religious front. It's interesting. Uh, even Jesus said, he said, um, birds have nests and foxes have dens, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You know? It's interesting that Jesus would choose to come humbly into the world. Um, verse 13, let's look at that real quick. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant in Jesus. And you handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. The God of our fathers, like I said, this was wisely introduced in the beginning of his discourse that it might appear that they taught no new religion. In other words, I'm not here to teach you something you don't already know. I'm teaching you what you do know, which was inconsistent with that. Moses, and, uh, and we're far from having the least designed to, uh, let me read this Let's hold quote because it's not as confusing. So it says, The God of our fathers, this was wisely introduced in the beginning of the discourse, that it might appear that they taught no new religion that was inconsistent with that of Moses and were far from having the least design to divert uh, their regards from God, from the God of Israel. In other words, they're trying to say, This is the same God. This is the same God. And, when, and it says, when God had given him to you, in other words, the God that you know had given you Jesus, and when you ought to have received him as the most pre precious treasure, you, uh, and you should have received him, and you should have preserved him with all your power, but you didn't. And he's really trying to put some blame on them, really trying to put some weight on their shoulders. And it says that you... He's, man, he's, he's calling accountability here in saying that you renounced the Holy One whom God had marked out as such. And you have um, renounced the just one, even in the judgment of Pilate. All the way up to Pilate, everybody is guilty. Everybody is guilty. Now, why do you think it was so hard for them to understand that Jesus was the Messiah?
Mark Nixon, not at all was at the crucifixion. It, it doesn't say that. I mean, so a lot of people kind of turned their back on Jesus. Well, you know, but you, you, he did, at least he did have John with him. Yeah, he had John. <laughs> he could say, well, John and John can say, I was there, I was with his mother. And who, did, who got to live with the old man? Yeah, interesting enough. Uh, uh, one thing that we, we see here is, uh, so Peter was right before this. All right, uh, so when Peter's, uh, when he saw Peter and John about to and he asked him for money, uh, Peter said, look at us. Peter, he picks him up, he heals him. And then, let's see, where's it at? When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. And then it says, while the man held with Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running. In other words, they came and they said, we need to know the facts. <laughs> what did you do? What did you do? And Peter took that as, oh, you want me to, you want me to tell you what you did wrong, evidently, because Peter takes that as the opportunity to present the gospel. He didn't, he didn't explain the miracle. He said, well, if you want to know what the miracle is about, the miracle is about what Jesus has done and what he's done through the power of the Holy Spirit through us today. It's not about anything that we've done, but about the very one that you crucified. See what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of like Jesus is alive, but he's living through us. Right. Now, I will ask this question about the Holy Spirit. In Genesis, it talks about um, when, when the earth is being formed, that the Spirit of God hovered over the water. Well, is that the same Spirit that's the Holy Spirit? Whatever we see? Or is that God the Father? I'm glad you asked that question. All right. I thought about this a lot. All right. I mean, you read in the Old Testament where it says the Spirit came on alive, you know, you know, and people who I've heard, I've never heard you say it, but I've heard others say it, but that was a different type of Spirit. It came on them, but it didn't go in them. I, I, I disagree with them. I, I say, no, I, I think it's the same thing. I think it's thing. the same thing, too. Yeah, uh, I think in the beginning in the garden, they were all three there. There was the Father. There was the Son and there was the Holy Spirit. I believe they were there in the garden. Number one, in John chapter one, it mentions that he was with him in the beginning. You know, that Jesus was with him. And I think they all three were there. Uh, one person, three beings, whatever you want to, whatever it takes in your mind to understand that concept, um, one and the same. Um, it's just hard to grasp that, I know, because we go, it's God and it's the <coughs> Son. And, yeah. Well, we can understand it. But anytime something major happened, um, like, okay, the beginning of Ezekiel, for, for, for instance, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 1 and 2, uh, you, you have, will you flip to that, Ezekiel chapter 1? I want to I show something to you. Feel like borrow your, your Bible there. Because we're talking about the Spirit of God and kind of how this looked in. You're good, you're good. I want to read a passage of scripture and kind of talk a little bit about this Holy Spirit that's came. Without turning as they went. And the appearance 
of the living creatures was like burning coals of fire, or like torches, and fire moved back and forth among the creatures, and it was bright, and lightning flashed out of it, and the creatures sped back and forth like flashes of lightning. And it said they moved where the spirit All I remember is the secret saying this in a dream, or is he saying it live? It doesn't say it's a dream. Oh, I gotta go. Oh, it, it, yeah, it mentions that. It begins, it, it, it goes on further. All right. And it keeps, and it talks about these spinning wheels that are inside of it, and they spin this way, and they spin this way, and they spin this way, and they spin this way. And it goes on through that, and there's even more. It said, and then in verse 25 of chapter 1, this is what it says. Well, verse 24, it said, When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings like a roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. Now, what did they say on the day of Pentecost? It was like rushing wind. Now the Spirit here is in Ezekiel. It's like rushing water. It's that sound of things moving around you. And interesting enough, too, it goes on and it says, Then and there, in verse 25, came a voice from above the expanse over their heads as they stood with lower wings, and above the expanse over their heads was what looked like a throne of sapphire. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up looked like glowing metal, and it was full of fire. And from there down, he looked like fire, and great light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. I wonder if that's the Spirit of God. Is this rainbow of presence around him. And it says, This appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Now listen to this. He says, When I saw it, I fell face down, and then I heard the voice of the mighty one speaking. So we understand now that this power that's come on, the disciples uh, was just alive and just as powerful here in Ezekiel. Years before this happens. Now I want to point out one more thing before we move on. And he said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. So he said, So God tells him to stand up. And as he spoke, the Spirit came in me and raised me to my feet. Yeah. He wasn't able to stand. Mm -hmm. And then I heard him speak. And he goes on and on. Yeah. But it says, it says, I was on my face, and he said, Stand up. Well then I was on my feet. <laughs> You know, it said in the very beginning, it talks about this windstorm. Mm -hmm. so, the Holy Spirit is described as like, like a wind. And, it, and it's interesting that, that that's how it chooses to manifest itself. Think about when, um, when God showed himself to Moses. Okay? That was great. When? That was great. And then he came in the still small voice, but I wonder if the things that came before that was the very spirit of God that was moving ahead of God himself because, you know, Moses said it, all he could see was his back because he couldn't look upon him or he would have killed him. So we see that this power that's come upon him in the book of Acts is not something, uh, it's not something, some little silent prayer. This is a very active, roaring presence of God. A very active and roaring presence of God. And it said, while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in one place called Solomon's Colonnade. The Solomon's Colonnade, I believe, was the courtyard area of the temple. If you look at a picture of the temple, I believe Solomon's Colonnade is a portion of that courtyard. Uh, we'd have to look at it. It's probably in your Bible. Some of you have uh, bigger, thicker Bibles. You probably have some pictures of the temple. But Solomon's Colonnade. And when Peter saw this, he said, the fellow is like, why does this surprise you? But I'll be honest, if it today, we'd all be quick. <laughs> so, so chapter 2 was all about how the power came. Chapter 3 is the first instance of how the power affected the people. And now from here on out, we will see that played out. Up to chapter 9, it will be played out through the life of Peter. And then after chapter 9, it will be played out through the life of Paul. And we'll see Paul's conversion. We'll also see how the uh, we'll also see how uh, the church began to establish itself, how they began to meet. It will also <laughs> establish how many deacons. The word deacons come from, as we see, Stephen is a deacon, 
and how he is the first martyr <coughs> for Christ. And we'll see that come about. And we'll see how, uh, you know, how Paul saw the vision of Jesus. And then it also talks about after he saw the vision of Jesus, he was blinded. And then he said, go, and in so many days, a guy named Barnabas is going to come to you, and then you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And that Paul doesn't begin his ministry until he receives the Holy Spirit. It's an important fact after important fact of how this is working. And so the thing that we've been talking about is that we must receive the Holy Spirit in order to do the powerful things that God has for us. And because that and the Holy Spirit, what it's done here in this chapter is it's opened up the door for more to receive Jesus because it displayed its wonderful works of power. And then when they were all astonished, amazed, and didn't know what else to think, in comes, hey, you need to receive Jesus. He needs to be the Lord of your life. And I think it's the same for us in this church. When we see the power of God, it needs to open up the door to say, see, he's real, and you need him. Any questions about chapter 3? I know it's a little shorter than the other ones, but any questions on chapter 3? Looking through that again. This is where Peter gives his scathing reply. He killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man who you see and know was made strong in his Jesus' name, and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him. I like that part. Yeah. So they immediately gave the credit. So many times I, I see Christians tell other Christians, if you don't have enough faith, there's a reason something happens. It's not having enough faith, it's who you have faith in. Mm -hmm. and, and that word tells you that right there. Yep. And it says, Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance. In other words, you were ignorant for a time, but you're not ignorant any longer. Yeah. And it's the same for us. When we see the working power of God, we are no longer claim ignorance. We know God. We know Him to be God. And when we turn away from Him, we're accountable at that point. Um, I know Lance and I, we've talked about that on ages of um, accountability and you know when does a kid understand and when do they not understand and when, when are they held responsible. And, and, and I really don't know if, if there's a direct age. You know, some people say it's 12 years old, around 12 years old, but I don't know how you know that. I think if your kid understands that Jesus is the Messiah, he wants to live his life, he, you know, he, he wants to pray, pray with him. It can't, it can't hurt you. That's for sure. Uh, but, and then, uh, this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that the Messiah was coming through. And he's just reminding them, this was told about you long before you ever had it. But long before this ever happened, you knew it was coming. All right, that's it for chapter 3. Unless there's any more questions. Um, if you don't have the Bible app and you want the notes that I have, I, I can print these off for you tonight before you leave. These are the notes that, that we told off of tonight. That There's several things in here that we didn't mention. Um, I'd like a copy. Yeah, I'll, you can, I'll give you a copy right after this, Chris. And any other time that we have, each week we'll have notes. And if, and if you want copies of them, we can get copies of them. Like I said, you can also get the, the notes in the events under the Bible app. Uh, let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you for uh, another chance to study your word tonight, God, and just looking really at one story, God, where you brought somebody up, God, who was lame and stood, stood them upon their feet, God, and just reminding us again, uh, Lord, that your power can come upon us in a way that causes us to do supernatural things, to live in supernatural ways, and it can uh, approach our very insecurities and our very infirmities, God, and you can make them whole, God. And I thank you for that. And we look to you, God, and just thank you that things come to pass, God, and not to stay, Lord. And, uh, Lord, we thank you for today, Lord, the chance to be together. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.